Hey, how you going, random stranger? It's another day and another volume of Hoseki no Kuni or Land of the Lustrous. Um, I'm happy you're here for what appears to be the beginning of a mass gem uprising. And I, I have a surprising amount of empathy for both Sensei as well as the various gems who have chosen to go to the moon with Foss. But weirdly not so much for Foss. In fact the understanding I had for their actions since returning from the moon started to ebb away a bit when I reread the last volume. Um, not completely but I did you know start shaking my head at certain points and just being like why Foss? So um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, once again, I am glad that you guys are really along with me because last time I did forget or I missed um, a few things and people were kind enough to point those out to me. So thank you Nerdy3177 and Isena Alpha for reminding me that the Lunarians uh, do regenerate on the moon even if they get destroyed on the earth and like of course they do because otherwise they wouldn't be having such a hard time trying to become nothing. So my momentary sadness over Cicada being decapitated by Sensei was just that momentary. It's uh, it's weird what my brain does as soon as there's like a name, a face and a personality that's put to a Lunarian. I really like Sakata and I'm really glad that he's going to be around for a while. Uh, Asena Alpha and Yaku Yavanen also mentioned that in the last few panels, you see Sakata carrying the box which has uh, Padpa's body in it. And I can only assume that that means Rutil is confirmed going to the moon because, you know, to see if lunar technology can help with synthesizing the parts of Padpa, they will need to stay awake for longer. Uh, so I'm fairly certain Rotil was part of the deserting party, even though the very last panel of the last volume didn't really show them. There's just no way that Rotil would allow Padpa out of their sights, you know, their life's work. Uh, also, I remembered in one of the ending comic strips, Rutil informs a very weirded out Foss that they really love feeling the insides of the holes in Padpa's body, <laughs> which sounds so wrong, but this is the gem mob, so it is what it is. And, you know, in any case, Rutil would not stand for being separated from Padpa. Last time as well, I went on this tangent trying to figure out what it meant when Akimia said that Sensei had originally been created to keep the last human from being lonely and uh, Craig Starbird left a really helpful comment in that the phrase is probably less literal and more metaphorical. So Sensei was more or less made to outlast humanity so the assumption would be that Sensei would keep that last human company in their final moments due to his nature as a machine but not that that was one of Sensei's explicit purposes in his creation which makes sense to me and like helped me like untie that mental knot. I think now I think of Sensei as being designed to be almost like a digital pet programmed to run on some incredibly strong, infinitely durable hardware who just happened to develop the ability to pray for other human souls. But to call him the, the equivalent of like a an indestructible Tamagotchi feels wrong and awful as well because he does have a very high level of sentience and the ability to feel love and rebel and anger and all sorts of human-like emotions. It would be interesting to find out whether those human characteristics evolved over a very long period of time and whether he was able to become even more human-like after the humans disappeared, which I theorize might be the case given the clues in the last volume around how Sensei responds to humans versus how he is with other gems. My tentative thoughts are that Sensei was programmed to obey humans, but once there were no humans left, that programming didn't really have a purpose anymore, and so it started 
branching out on its own and following a, a logical path of increasing independence and sentience in the absence of any command prompts. And so you end up with Sensei, who was able to develop more human-like relationships with other gems and who is refusing to be forced to pray anymore, especially not by a bunch of Lunarians who aren't really human in form. All right, so time for a quick recap and a stock take of where all our gems are at and how they took the return of Foss and Foss's carefully crafted stories about the moon and what the Lunarians are like. At first, um, I want to point out that it's notable that the other gems are just really happy that Foss is back. They're all amazed because it's the first time ever that anyone has returned from the moon. And Dai even says to Foss, you know, you are our ray of hope. But then Foss lies about having forgotten everything. And the gems, at least on the surface, accept that and they just kind of move on. I did find it fascinating that it was Dyer out of all people who was the one to point out to Foss that they know they're lying, but Dyer didn't really quite get the motivation right. You know, Foss didn't lie about forgetting what was on the moon because they didn't want to scare the other gems. It's just they were figuring out how to fish them in one by one and do it in a more subtle manner. I suspect that if Foss hadn't started seeding those moon stories and sort of tugging on each of their individual insecurities, and of course if the Lunarians weren't coming back for them, Foss could have just waltzed right back into the rhythm of gem life and everything would have gone on as before, as usual, like nothing had happened, which is the way that this society deals with trauma. Um, you know, you just kind of let time paper over pain. The other person who did seem genuinely glad that Foss was back was Sensei, but it's intriguing seeing how distant he is towards Foss. And another theory is that he's being like that because Foss is now more human than not. It does seem that the pearl eye that Foss so graciously received from Akemia did change things. Um, I think there were several tells for this weird shift. The first was when Sensei knelt before Foss on the beach. You could say he was just shocked and overjoyed that one of his kids had actually come back from the moon intact. But I'm pretty keen on um, the speculative theory put forward by Lunatic, which is that the eye contained human cells. Sensei is being more compliant to Foss and is being monotonous in his replies like a machine serving a human master. Unlike before when Foss couldn't really get any answers from Sensei. And I find that fascinating. Remember how the human particle kept flashing in Foss's mind during their time on the moon? And the second time it happened was right after Foss got that eye. So even if it turns out that there aren't actually human particles in the eye itself, Foss is just one or two materials away from completing their collection of all seven treasures of the Buddhist treasure tower, which, as we've brought up several times in the past, symbolizes the highest form of human enlightenment. Also, it's not just the kneeling thing. Sensei actually answers Foss straight up when they blurt out the question, were you a tool made by the humans? And Sensei answers without hesitation. He's like, yes, that's true. Given how he used to shut down Foss so bad at the merest edging towards anything related to humans, that's why I did double take because he seems to have become way more accommodating and it's almost like he can't not answer Foss, which harks back to what Akemi has said, that Sensei is programmed to not be able to talk about humans unless the humans give him permission to, which makes Foss the human here. There's also how he's totally not interested in finding out what Foss did or saw on the moon, even though Foss keeps egging him on, and even though in the past he's always asked for detailed reports. And the other gems also comment on how strange that is. 
Sensei, you know, he just walks by and, and seems to ignore Foss, which really irks Foss. And there was also the moment where Foss asks Sensei to um, be able to do patrol all by themselves while Kane Gorm is sleeping. And Sensei just immediately grants it, like grants the permission to do that. And that also shocks Foss. So all of these hints put together suggest that maybe because Foss has achieved a significant tipping point where they're more human than they're not, Sensei has reverted back to responding to them like a machine. Um, a machine, yes, that was made to prevent humans from being lonely, but nevertheless a machine that was made to obey. I found it sad to see Foss interpreting this as Sensei uh, waiting to see if they'll sink themselves, which I don't think is the case at all. I just think there's something weird going on with his programming and how it's responding to Foss's um, change in physical makeup. But unfortunately, Foss reads it a completely different way. They're angry over how Sensei doesn't seem to care what they do and sees him as arrogant and dismissive of Foss's ability to challenge his authority. And so Foss ends up vowing to crush Kongo Sensei. This full breakdown of Foss's relationship with Sensei, at least from their perspective, is tragic. There's no more love left in Foss for Sensei, and that actually caught me off guard. Um, I'm not totally against Foss, and I understand uh, the source of much of their anger. And actually, Barry McCoconut made a, a great point about how Foss might blame Sensei for the gems getting kidnapped, even though it's really the Lunarians at fault. But Foss sees Sensei essentially as an enabler, like allowing it to happen for so long. Um, at the same time, I'm worried there's something else going on there on top of the justified anger. I actually came to sympathize a bit more with Yuke's concern that Foss might have inherited Lapis's thing of not really doing things for the good of all the gems, but rather more for the sake of satisfying their own intellectual curiosity. And if we think back to Foss's motivations for going to the moon in volume seven, it was partially because they were mad at Sensei for being so unwilling to divulge any information. And that was before they knew about the human programming. But a large part of it was also because they wanted to see if they could do it. Um, it was out of curiosity and pure ambition. Um, and, and to quote Foss, it was, uh, this will tell me how far I can go. We've also seen signs of that ambition elsewhere like for example when Foss is super confident that they can just put themselves back together after being chopped in two and now even after knowing from Aikmia that you can't really blame Sensei for being so evasive and passive that's just how he was made um Foss still doesn't give Sensei any slack and I find that both hilarious and sad because I myself was super tough on Sensei before I knew anything about the circumstances of his creation. But now that I know, you know, just like Foss knows, I'm very sympathetic towards Sensei and I wonder if there might be another way to deal with this conflict that doesn't involve outright hatred and betrayal and wanting to crush and defeat Sensei. Um, to me, at least, Foss's approach just seems so extreme and might be born of a place where they're also testing themselves to see how far they can push Sensei. So Foss has two types of goals going on here. The altruistic one of ending the kidnappings and possibly giving all the gems closure to their pain, but also the selfish one of seeing how successful they can be in outsmarting and toppling Sensei. I think for now, those two have to be on the same track as each other, but I feel there's going to be some major conflict when the ends of the altruistic route and the selfish route start like diverging. 
at the same time, Foss is being the most clear-headed they've been for a while, I feel. The hallucinations of Antark seem to be gone. They're not being overly forcibly happy unless they're trying to piss off Kangorm. And we haven't seen the gold alloy, you know, kind of seep out of them uncontrollably for a while. And they have a clear if crazy plan for ending this war. So that brings us to um, Foss's strategy of picking at each of the gem's weaknesses and getting them to act for themselves, which I agree is the best way to avoid suspicion. So um, to go down the list of Foss's successful targets, we have Rutil, who is going for a chance at treating Padpa. There's Daya, who just wants to be somewhere where there's no bort. Um, Yellow wants like a last chance to apologize to their former partners, you know, no matter how long that shot is. Um, the same with Lex, Sveen, Parado. Uh, they all want to just see their partners too. Um, Red Beryl for their interest in Luna fashion. And Benito. Benito was an interesting case. Uh, when they find out that Foss's powder doesn't come off, even though they fell into the sea, um, and they find out, or oh, maybe it's because of moon technology, they're very curious about it and they're embarrassed even about being curious about it. And then later on, they talk about feeling too normal, which is fair enough given what an eccentric bunch the gems are. And I found this reason for their wanting to go to the moon the most intriguing because it's like an inversion of our own world. Usually it's people who don't fit into that normy like square peg who want to escape to somewhere where they can just be themselves. We also have Amethyst 33 signing up for the moon mission after Foss tells them how different the Lunarians are and they wonder whether their personalities would have been completely different too if they just spent some time on the moon. Um, and they reveal that they've been wondering if there's some safe way to practice being apart from 84, uh, which is sad because obviously 84 heard all of that but was pretending to be asleep. So it's actually kind of amazing how Foss has managed to convince so many gems to go with them to the moon. Foss is what the Lunarians have been waiting for for all this time. On their own, the Lunarians failed to convince any gem to cooperate and, you know, almost every one of them either self-destructed or they lost their minds. So with Foss, they have an insider, someone who was able to take the gem's raw material of their insecurities and their wishes and desires and secrets and manipulate them perfectly into doing what they want. Without knowing that that raw material was available, Foss would never have been able to convince them, even if they deployed the most sophisticated, persuasive sophistry ever. However, it's Cinnabar who rejects Foss outright, which I thought was pretty badass. Um, and they rejected Foss's offer despite Foss telling them everything. You know, including how a sensei is a machine the humans created to work for them, that the Lunarians kidnap gems because they want to provoke sensei, and that the plan is to force sensei to work by inspiring anger. And Foss basically admits to Cinnabar that they are cooperating with the Lunarians. So here is a good time to bring up the question of whether the entire premise of shocking sensei like never before to make him work is even a sound plan because all we have is Aikmir's word to go by and which Foss oddly accepts at face value even though they've told themselves that Aikmir isn't someone they should trust just yet uh, and related to that point Shodan 1 made some really excellent uh points in a previous video uh, they wrote from what we have learned the let's crush your children and display the corpses is by far the most evil thing they have done so referring to 
the how the Lunarians, you know, ground the gems into dust and just spread it out over the moon's surface to show Sensei. Um, but it's also the most confusing and pointless. They have been doing it for hundreds, even thousands of years, and it's had absolutely no effect. They don't even know if Sensei knows it's happening. It's a plan that they should have that should have been abandoned a long time ago. Uh, granted, this action is similar to the gems' immortality leading them to never giving up on anything, but it's always been something that really stands out as a question that should be answered. Why? Yeah, but like, why indeed? The, the definition of insanity is trying something over and over and over and expecting a different result, which is what the spreading gem dust over the moon's surface is and what trying to shock Sensei into working again seems to be too. But Foss, Foss is basing their entire plan on the Lunarian's theories of how to reset Sensei, seemingly without really digging more into whether those theories are based on more than just pure conjecture. It's true that Sensei has never been betrayed by his own before and it's certainly a new tactic but I just really wonder at why Foss since spending time on the moon has become so one track minded against Sensei as I said before it I feel it's more than just because Sensei has let this war go on for so long uh, I think the time that Foss spent on the moon, you know, seeing their technology and their city, their food, their way of life, it might have just rubbed off on them and they're thinking that the moon isn't so bad, you know, grass is greener on the other side type thing. Um, for Cinnabar's part, they take all of Foss's revelations relatively well. They they don't look shocked or outraged at Foss's planned betrayal. Their first reaction is instead, oh, you know, I'd feel bad for Sensei. I'm not going. And then they just exit stage left. After that is the point where I feel Foss truly Fs up big time with Cinnabar. They corner Cinnabar and then they start blabbing out things that aren't necessarily true. Things that are coming from a place of anger, but also like a weird place of utter rejection of Sensei beyond what feels reasonable. They tell Cinnabar first off that they're being stupid, that, you know, Sensei wasn't born the same as us. We were never related. We only follow that blockhead because we're too weak to fight back. You know, he's a jerk and all he ever did was drag us into this war. And that whole rant really laid bare Foss's motivations. Like, first of all, concern for Cinnabar and what good that going to the moon would do them hasn't been a priority for a long time now. Secondly, this idea of Sensei not being born the same way as them was actually pretty hurtful. Like, does it even matter? At the So at the end of the volume, the last volume in the translation notes, there was a section on synthetic versus real gems. Even though Sensei as a creation of humans is made of like synthesized um, hexagonal diamond and he, he bypassed the millions of centuries it takes for a gem to form naturally. The process by which Sensei would have been made um, would have replicated that natural process and just sped up a lot through, you know, artificial compression. Technically synthesized gems are gems in all the ways that matter. So they're identical in appearance and chemical composition. So Foss drawing this like arbitrary line between real and fake and family and not family was a bit bizarre and kind of bigoted, to be honest. Um, to bring it back to like a real life parallel, it sounds like that small minority of people in the world you know, in every country, in every people group who cling to these fictionalized ideas of what makes someone deserve to be or deserve to belong to a certain national identity, you know, they have to be born in a certain place, have a certain lineage, um, look a certain way, which is all bullshit, right? Like group identities and histories are as malleable as liquid and 
there are other values that matter more than birthplace and bloodline. So to hear Foss kind of go down that path, even though, again, I understand their anger is bound up in lots of frustration and hurt from seemingly being ignored um, or trolled, (laughs) it just felt a step too far and feels like a willful forgetfulness of the genuine relationships that Sensei has built with their gem kids over all these thousands of years. Um, Wow, (laughs) just listening to myself defend Sensei is super weird as well. Um, Okay, even so, actually, I did say, well, Foss has lost a lot of their original parts, so maybe this forgetfulness comes from that. Like, they've lost any empathy for sensei because they've just lost all of their original parts and all those memories so then foss manages to make the situation even worse they go on to say that um the lunarians only want sensei it has nothing to do with us and in fact we're in danger just by being close to sensei and you can see that that is the point where cinema gets pissed (laughs) um I do, there was, there was, there was a comment that I want to bring in, uh, from Ra Chusosu, which really helped me think through why Cinnabar did what they did. Uh, they wrote, the thing is that a lot of the arguments Foss uses to get Cinnabar on their side are of the same nature that the ones, um, that have Cinnabar in their own way alienated from gem society. Foss uses phrases such as sensei is not the same as us, he has nothing to do with us, and of course we are in danger just by being close to sensei. It's not too far-fetched to think that this conversation had the opposite effect on Cinnaba, making them feel alienated from Foss instead of sensei. Um, Yeah, that was a great insight. So not only does Cinnaba empathize with being lonely but also they know what it's like to be treated like literal poison and separated out um you know previously remember that cinnabar wasn't fully against foss trying to find dirt on sensei the main reason why they weren't more active in helping foss was that they thought foss wasn't thinking far ahead enough so they were like you know what are you gonna do if you find out sensei has done something unforgivable which he hasn't, I don't think. Um, And if you don't know the answer to that, then I can't help you, is what they said. But Cinnabar also has tried to help Foss, or at least nudge them in the right direction when it comes to finding out the truth about Sensei. They were the one who suggested to Foss that they should ask Sensei things now that they have Lapis's intellectual power behind them to see if they can't detect something, you know, suspicious. Anyway, back to this dumpster fire of a conversation between Foss and Cinnabar. In a last gasp effort to convince Cinnabar to go to the moon, Foss says that the Lunarians can help Cinnabar get rid of their venom. Which sounded sus. Like, does Foss really know that's even possible? Or are they just desperately grasping at straws? And so... Uh, Raho Chisosu also pointed out that this is basically the same tactic that Foss uses with the other gems, like manipulating their weaknesses. Um, but at this point, Cinnabar was just too emotionally far apart from Foss to really take the bait. And yeah, and afterwards, like Foss has no idea where they went wrong, which is also really sad. A final few things before heading into the new volume. Uh, Foss reveals to Cairngorm that they're going back to the moon and that they won't be coming back. So the not coming back part was interesting. I guess that was part of the deal too. Uh, In the translation notes, there was a note about how in myths and legends, um, eating food from the land of the dead seals the diner's fate and prevents them from ever returning to the land of the living. And of course, we saw Foss chow down some moon food the 49-day period that Foss was away also lends support to that idea that there was some binding contract that was made that maybe even Foss isn't aware of. Uh, there were also like a lot of cool details in the last few chapters. The way that Bort slid past Cicada to save the Fossy thing was very cool. 
um, the Lunarian invention of the staff that Sakata uses to stab Voss with to pretend to fight, but also actually be able to communicate while they do that was genius. Um, I love that Kangon was very worried who would do winter duty uh, after Voss asked them to go to the moon with them, which is very Antark like, like that sense of responsibility. And lastly, in the final panel, we see uh, Alex is blindfolded and they're also holding onto Benito's hand, I think, which was very cute. Uh, and so that brings us to volume nine at last. Okay, starting with the cover page, it's Voss in the regal Lanarian outfit. And it's interesting that it's Jade and Yuke on the cover with them. The two gems, of course, who are the most suspicious um, kind of thing that Foss is up to no good. But the way that they're looking at Foss is so respectful and loving still. All right. Volume 9, Haruko Ichikawa. And I wonder whose leg that is. Probably should be able to tell from the shoe. Is that cinnabar? I don't know. And it looks like it's snowing something. Like bits of... <laughs> it looks like bits of shiro, but that can't be right. Ah, uh, that's... Kind of looks like a upturned basket of gem dust. Like they're trying to collect it or something. Maybe they're going to go back to the moon and try and put back together their lost gem brothers. Character introductions with Sakata just peeking out over the corner. I really love Sakata. The more I read about him and talk about him, um, he's just so innocent for a Lunarian. Benitoite, normal. <laughs> But that's a valuable trait in this group. Yeah, I mean, makes them stick out like a sore thumb, ironically. Alexandrite. Split personality, Mrs. Chrysoberyl. Oh, it was something else that I didn't mention from last film. It was interesting that Yuke saw Alex's hair flashing and um, turning different colours, staring off into space. Even though they weren't staring at any Lunarian, maybe they were just thinking about the moon so much that it caused their um, gem body to light up, which is interesting. Amethyst. <gasps> just the one. Half of a twin crystal feels like being alone at times, so that must be Amethyst 33. Wow, that's... The absence of 84 there is really jarring, surprisingly so. Phosphophyllite, still a hardness of 3.5, <laughs> lest we forget. The hero of our story, working hard. Hero is a, <laughs> it's a very broad term. And heroes aren't always necessarily good, you know. Kangom, formerly on Winter Duty, there is a reason behind the furrowed eyebrows. I mean, if I had to guess, it's probably thinking about how easily they let LaFosse walk all over them and boss them around and just thinking, well, <laughs> not that they enjoy it, but it's just who they are. They love them so much. Diamond, adorable. Adapts easy to new environments. Yellow Diamond, the eldest, has a surprisingly hard time dealing with unusual circumstances. That, oh, and they're going to the moon. I don't know if that's a foreshadowing of something bad happening to Yellow up on the moon. And Dia, of course, adapting very easily to it. Because interestingly, they have all of the gems that are going with them on the right hand side with Foss. Although I thought like Sphine Perido, you know, and Routil, they were also on board as well, going to Foss. Hmm. 
Euclides, kindly and knowledgeable, always considers what's best for everyone. Yeah, I mean, okay, so last video I made almost a direct comparison between the way that Uke is handling this centralization of information and more how more dictatorial or dictatorial regimes deal with knowledge. I want to make clear that in no way do I think Uke is being a dictator or enabling dictatorship. It's more, I, I do believe that they are just thinking what's the best for everyone. And, um, you know, they don't, they just don't want the gems to be used by anyone, even if it's like Foss who is meant to be one of them. But as we saw last volume, Yuke is very suspicious, even questioning whether Foss is really the same Foss that left. Um, Jade is secretly puzzled by Euclid's extreme reliability. Is there a mystery around that that is going to become really important later on? I don't know. Perido wants to just sit back and make paper. <laughs> I don't... I can, uh, no, that's right. Perido wanted to go to the moon because of their lost partner. Same as Fiend. So I... Uh, but I guess it would have sweetened the deal a bit if Foss had mentioned that they have technology that can make even better paper than what's capable on Earth. Sphine wants to just sit back and do woodwork. Okay. Bort feels the pressure of needing to be strong both physically and mentally. Yeah. I guess another reason why I don't think Bort would go to the moon, they... I guess they'd really stick by Sensei and be really loyal. And they're pretty much the apex predator <laughs> of the gems. So, you know, they're comfortable in that position. Cinnabar understands Congo's loneliness better than anyone. Yeah. Um, the smiling one is uh, Obsidian. Yeah. Probably don't get anything on Obsidian. Mm -hmm. Watermelon Tourmaline enjoys the present. Hemimorphite thinks seriously about the future, but still always enjoys the present. <laughs> By implication, Watermelon doesn't really think about the future. <laughs> uh, Ruth Hill, formerly the delinquent doctor, formerly, question mark, only thinks of Padbaradja. What are those boxes that the uh, gems on the right-hand side are sitting on? It looks like Lunarian furniture. Oh, interesting. So they're all sitting on what looks like very obviously to be sculpted, um, dare we say man-made objects. And then on the left, the left-hand side of gems are sitting on a tree trunk, it looks like. So something natural. It's again that... Um, divergence between what's natural and what's synthetic or made by something, someone. That's cool. I don't know what that big cloth thing is. Is that Sensei's robes? And I feel like this is the first time that Sensei hasn't been included in these character introduction sections. Hmm. Okay. Here we go, contents. Chapter 62, Distant View, High Hopes, One Day, Two Day, mm, Freedom. Oh, a chapter for Cangorm, just for Cangorm. Change, Constancy, that's interesting contrast. Before Dawn, Land of the New Labels. Mm, it sounds uh, red barrel associated that that last one. Mm, interesting. Okay, <laughs> you guys ready? Let's do this. Uh, chapter sixty two, distant view. Where's Rutil? I'm a bit worried. Watch out, Lex. There's a step here. Uh, okay. 
thinks, what are they going to do? They're going to remain blindfolded for the whole time, right? Unless part of their wish is to be healed, I guess, of their condition on the moon. I don't know, it feels like Foss really oversold the Lunarians a bit, just for the sake of getting them to go. And the only gem I think they told about the purpose behind getting them to leave was Cinnabar. None of the rest of them know. I wonder if they would choose differently if they knew. God, she trips, of course. Oops. Senior Lex, are you okay? Huh? Senior Lex? Who is that? Th thanks. That voice, Cargoshan? You're coming too, but you're so young. It must be rough having to deal with your condition. Goshen? Foss. So Foss doesn't want to lead astray the babies. Even Foss has limits. Yes! What are you doing here? Well, I passed by Senior Kangom's room on my way to bed and... Oh, are they doing the whole senpai thing? That's cute. What? Now? Oh, they overheard the conversation. Okay. Go on, hurry. Okay, okay. I'm going to change to get out of here, pervert. <laughs> That's when I heard you talking about maybe going to the moon. So I want to go too. You. What are they doing to Foss? <laughs> just pressing their hand against their head. You just leave Morga like that? Morga will be fine. Ooh. You young'uns can be scary. So remember Goshen was the more forward one of the two, of the pair. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the brashness of youth. Well, whatever, fine. Now that that's settled, clunk. Padba, I wonder what Padba would think about all of this. You know what, I think they, they'd be for it actually, you know, for the adventure for finding out the truth. Although, I do think they would see through a lot of Foss's manipulative techniques and tactics and be like, I'm not going with you until you give me the full story like they did with Cinnabar. Hmm. Listen, everyone. If you want to turn back, this is your chance. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Yeah, Rutiel is not there. Dang. Except for Kangon. Hey! <laughs> Why am I the only one who doesn't get a choice? Well, you're my partner, aren't you? Oh, so sneaky and shifty. You got a lot of nerve for a gem who's pretty much been asleep through our whole partnership. It's true, you're over a hundred years. Foss, don't worry. You're not the only one to blame here. We each made our own decision. Yeah, agreed. The thing is, they made their own own decision without full information you know with Foss withholding the most important bits uh, it just feels it just feels dirty <laughs> I don't know I've stepped onto the Lunarian platform They're scared. And Yellow is looking over Padpa. So I guess this is when they're being encased in the camouflage membrane. Yep. <gasps> Rutil didn't go with them, damn it. <sighs> but they let Padpa go. Whoa, now that I think about it, I can't go to the moon not with all my responsibilities here. And I definitely can't take Paparaccia with me. Without me, who would be here to fix everyone? 
I want to get Piper Retro moving again. <gasps> Wait, it doesn't seem like they know. Oh shit. <laughs> I want to reclaim that gem's worth with my own hands. I'd at least like to get Sensei's permission. If the answer is no, maybe I'll leave Piper Retro and go myself. Oh no. Sensei! Foss is gone! That's Jade. So are Jai and Yellow. Several others are missing too. Oh, why did they take Padpa then if Rutil hadn't decided yet? Maybe it was Yellow, because you know Yellow and Padpa are pretty pretty tight. Oh god, that was a that was a bad decision. Rutil! Yeah. They know. Their hair's out. Oh shit. Oh, there's the cracks in their face. Wow, this is the very first time that we've seen Rutil so um, moved, uh, unbalanced. So much so that cracks appear in the body. That. That piece of slag. Oh, Foss. And the others went along with it as well. Wait, sorry, I gotta go back and see if they actually knew that taking Padba was part of the plan. I don't think they knew. Look at Yellow's face down there. They're like, oh, what's in this box? But they sh surely they should have recognized Padpa's box. Oh, God, Retail. Retail, Yuke. The Cape of Emptiness. Boingy, boing. What is happening? <laughs> Jen's just coughing a feel. I've never actually touched a Lunarian before. Blingy bling, fluffy fluff. Okay, so Cicada's loving this. This is Cicada, who is actually very nice despite appearances. It feels strange. You are way too buddy buddy with the moon people. Can go on preserving a healthy amount of skepticism, even though they are, you know, still following along with Foss's wishes. So Foss, why do we bring Padparacha? Why did we bring Padparacha? What? Oh. I don't want Retiel to have to work so hard. Oh man, remember that? I guess that's what Padpa said themselves. Like they don't really want Retail um, slaving away on this one thing on them. Interesting. Also, that Foss forgot for a sec there. <laughs> oh, I reckon. I don't know. You should have told Retail before that. This is gonna bite him in the butt bad that's what paparazzi said right uh i don't know but it sounds like something paparazzi would say cicada can we look outside <sighs> he's being such a good boy <laughs> oh But die, you can still. I'm fine. Oh, separation is. It's painful. Mm. 
That gem does stand out, even from this distance. <laughs> that wall in there. Sleeping robes, I guess. And Reteal has just gone unhinged. Look at the hair, you know, the nicely done hair is all out. It's cracks all over. The facial expression. Man, I bet they feel so bad. And they're gone. Cinnabar, just watching them disappear. Someone's rung the bell. The gong. Is that Foss staring down at Cinnabar? Just with her kind of like a look of affection. End of chapter 62. Chapter 63. High hopes. Ah, this is. It's only the first chapter of this volume, and I'm already a little bit heartbroken. Gong. I'll hear that bell from inside. That was fast. Huh? Eek. Ah, oh, yep. Yeah, so it's really quick to take that trip from Earth to the moon. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> The red carpet welcome. Akemia really playing his cards right. Making sure to endear themselves to these gems. Of course he's not going to straight up ground them up into dust the second they arrive. He's got like, he's playing this longer term game and it's so crazy. Look at all those like Lunarians down the bottom. <laughs> like they're greeting a celebrity like at the Oscars or something. So it's confetti. Oh, is that what was coming down on the cover? It's like moon confetti. <sighs> Flash. This is, this is crazy. Look at all those Lunarians like kneeling be down before them. Like making sure that cloth thing is straightened out <laughs> welcome back and greetings lustrous ones we're happy to have you i notice um wait does akimia have a beauty mole on his like under his left eye he's also dressed up very nicely Again, just using the clothes to instill the image that he wants to whoever it is that he's talking to. And then the moon petals coming down. I don't know if Foss is a match for Akemia's scheming. I think Foss is, in a way, being played just as much. That's a Lanarian too? It's talking, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, so on the moon, everyone, all the gems can understand the Lanarians. Hey, come here. Twitch. Would you please not call me by that name? It's embarrassing. You and your hang-ups. That's right, they, um, you don't want a name because your goal is to become nothing and by putting a name on yourself and an identity, that's the opposite of the direction you want to be going in. Uh, these are the gems I convinced to come with me. Benita White? <laughs> Looks so nervous. Alexandrite. Goshenite. <laughs> oh, Cicada just freaking them out. Just being a big friendly puppy, you know? Diamond. Cangorm. The furrowed eyebrows. Yellow diamond. 33 of the amethyst twin crystal. Actually, I'm 84. Oh, sh <laughs> they took 33's ticket 
to the moon. Everyone's like, what? <laughs> oh, I love all of these twists we're getting just straight up. Really? Really? Sorry for mixing you up. Oh no, you were right. I felt bad making my twin go to the moon, so I switched my hair and tried to trick you. And now here I am. 30? Can we talk? I can't, <laughs> I can just can't tell if what they're saying is real. I'm sorry for deceiving you. No, I'm sorry. Ugh, plus it's like, you think I'm the one being deceived here? Oh man. Dang, I wonder what, if this is 84, I wonder what 33 being left back there feels. Clunk, there goes Piper's box. Thank you, General. Of course, General Cicada, okay. This is Padparacha, who might wake up if we, plug up if we plug up all these holes. It would be best to use minerals from the same family with no inclusions. I understand. I believe we have some lab-growing corundum in stock. Bring me all of our finest warm-coloured samples. I will examine the gem personally. Oh... You'll have to leave Padbaracha with me. Is that all right? Yellow's like, <sighs> as long as there's no smashing. Don't worry. I won't be pulverizing this one. <sighs> oh, I can't imagine what the, the gems who have just, who have seen their first glimpse of the moon and who are now conversing, having their first conversation with a real Lunarian are feeling. The casualness with which he said that, like, what i'm pretty sure foss didn't tell them about the sand and what that's made of i think i don't know some of them are gonna go crazy like what akmia said you know most of them went crazy probably because finding out what they do to gems what I won't be pulverizing this one or any of you. That's <laughs> real reassuring. You may spend your time here as you see fit. What would you like to do about Alexandrite's unique condition? Sure you don't intend to keep that blindfold on. I'll discuss it with Alex. I understand. <sighs> Interestingly, Foss has already conveyed all of their intel on each of the gems to Akemia. Now, if you'll excuse me, lustrous ones, I hope you'll make yourselves at home. <laughs> First, there's something I need to tell you all. Which thing, Foss, like, that the moon has gem dust all over it, corpses, your own family, that Sensei is a machine, that you actually orchestrated an entire betrayal of the one person they all love the most without them even knowing it. <sighs> Look, even though they all chose to go to the moon and leave Sensei, I don't know if I think they thought that it was temporary and that it was something like, you know, a quick trip to the moon and back kind of thing. And also it didn't come from a place of hating Sensei because obviously they weren't aware of, you know, all of the stuff that Foss is. You mean... This is what happened to all the older gens. Yes. They're all on 
their knees in the sand. They were all ground into powder and strewn across the moon. The pieces that we previously took back from the Lunarians gave us so much hope and despair, but they were all fakes. It was all part of the Lunarians' plot. They gave us fake pieces that were made here. That's why, no matter how long we waited, we were never able to fully repair a single gem. It's all part of the plan I told you about. Their plan to get Sensei working again. Hey, come on, do you actually believe everything that Aikmia told you? Kango, thank you so much. I wouldn't trust a word that Lunarian says. I agree. But not everything I heard was a lie. I asked Sensei directly if the tool for the humans thing was true and Sensei confirmed it. Seriously? Sigh. I wish I could have asked a lot more questions. But I'm way scared of Sensei, much, much more so than I was before. I just couldn't do it. Are you sure it's not just because you felt guilty? <laughs> yeah, thank you. And that's Foss. Okay, so now Foss is being all emotional, like the alloy is spilling out again. Yeah, definitely Foss is playing their cards really close to their chest and Kangon can see right through it. Lex? Oh god, more of them cracking. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you before I, we left. I didn't think you would believe me. Oh man. This is crazy. Like, we've seen two gems now that have cracked because they're so emotionally overwhelmed. Like, for the first eight volumes, none of that other than Foss. Um, and, well, Cinnabar. Cinnabar had the whole Mercury, you know, rushing out of them. But this is, yeah, the other gems never. They were just all pretty chill until now. I'll talk to Aikmi about putting everyone back together. When? <laughs> what? You haven't already? Uh, well, you know, I needed to get the Lunarians or actually Aikmi to trust me enough. Otherwise, it would have been tough to negotiate for anything. <gasps> Oh my gosh, are they... They're cracking too, right? That's yellow and bonita white. Alright, I'm going. Oh, uh, I don't... Yeah. Foss did not think far enough. Like, to drop these truth bombs on them after they've reached the moon and after it's like you can't ever go back. That was a that was an underhanded move, I gotta say, Foss. I know, it just doesn't sit right. Alright, I'm going. It's at the intersection. Sigh. I thought that if they came to the moon voluntarily, if our friends were here with us, if I explained everything and showed that there's a way to fix it, that none of them would fall apart. Is it really okay to let that creeper know my ultimate goal? I have to be sure to not let on how important it is. I'll have to choose my words carefully. You know, Foss has a very precarious, inaccurate definition of what true consent is. <laughs> if this was argued in um, a court of law, I don't think there would be, you know, all of the elements of consent there. Kind of a scam artist for us. Glint. Eh? <gasps> Whoa. 
that was quick man so as soon as i filled it up with a synthetic uh corundum they work out oh i'm excited i mean i am excited to get more pod pa Rutil would be so pissed, I think, knowing that it was a Linarian, first of all, who solved this problem that they've been trying to solve for thousands of years in a like an in an instant. You're phosphophilite, right? I can't believe that was there. You're already I recognize your alloy arms. But I can't believe you're really using Lapis's head. It's just like Aiken had told me. Would you please not call me that? <laughs> Salty. It's embarrassing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you betrayed Sensei? That's a bold move. <laughs> I thought I wanted you to tread carefully. It's too hard to predict what will happen. But... What are they? What's Padma wearing? It's sort of like a... What you... Like those gowns you get at the hospital. But... My body's in better shape than it's ever been, so I give up. <laughs> I'll be doing a post-op exam later. I'd like to get some data. Try to avoid any strenuous movement for the next two or three days. Will do. Oh, interesting that um, Aikmia changed his outfit to be that of a doctor. It's like a chameleon, you know, just changes for the occasion. I, I'm glad to see you. I really am. Can you change gems back from powder too? <sighs> He's going to say no, isn't he? Making the glasses disappear. I'll try. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, man. Foss just went out on a limb, not even knowing that it was possible. Really? However, it won't be nearly as easy as fixing Pepperetta. It will take a staggering amount of time to accomplish. Not a problem. Does that cover all of your demands? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> the thing is, they don't want to spend so much... The they want to become nothing as quick as possible. And so the fact that restoring these gems will take time is not really in the roadmap. Then allow me to state mine. As you can see, we have not yet returned to nothing. I have high hopes that your next move will yield results. What is the next move? Like kidnapping the other gems, the ones that didn't voluntarily go, voluntarily go. Oh, man. So we've got the gems cracking up in the moon because they just can't handle what they've found out that Foss has finally told them. And then we have the gems on Earth who are pissed off at Foss, especially Rutil. And who are probably now in danger too because Foss has to keep trying to break Sensei. Chapter 64, one day. Those petals look like the ones that they threw around the, you know, in the confetti when they welcomed the gems. Poor Sensei. Sensei, you're awake. I'm sorry. Oh, God. Is that 33? <sighs> what? They're so devastated that they've been separated from their twin finally, even though it was something that they thought they wanted. <sighs> Can you walk? Yes. Sphene. Do they what? 
Everyone is cracked, but Red Barrel went to search the cliffs at the shore of nascency and hasn't come back. Rutil went into the sea at the Cape of Emptiness. Okay, so this is Sensei collecting all of his broken kids. Yoink. Sensei, I was the first one Foss tried to recruit. If I had, it isn't your fault. Bort went deeper into the water. With the jellyfish, no doubt. Oh, uh, this is uh Sensei putting the doctor back together. They're barely even holding themselves together at this point. This is everyone. So Sphina and Perido didn't end up going either. Oh my gosh, they're they're all so beaten up. If, as if they weren't already not, like, traumatized enough already, they have to deal with this. You know, I... I think if the other gems, and maybe even Foss, if they knew that this was the impact that they would have on everyone else, they would really think twice about leaving in that manner. No one did anything wrong. And Sensei is being so <laughs> understanding. Cinnabar wins. I'm glad you came. Please come a little closer. A little closer. <laughs> There's something that I cannot tell you. It's about myself. To you... It may sound impossibly confusing and illogical in the extreme. There are things I am forbidden to communicate, so I cannot tell you everything no matter how hard I try. But I will tell you everything I am able to, and I hope you will listen. Cinnabar knows. I think they would appreciate that this is Sensei trying his hardest within his limits to tell them what's happening. I wasn't born the same way any of you were. What the Lenarians want is the be ancient life forms to Oh, it's that it's sort of like bleeps out his words whenever it touches upon humans. In other words, they want me. Everything would be solved if I were no longer with you. I wonder if you could write it on paper. No, but then, I don't know, probably disappear or something. You wouldn't be able to make out the words. But I cannot destroy myself. And as you all know, it is extremely difficult for outside forces to damage me. After the... Dot, 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 I was alone on the Earth's surface for many years, okay? Then one day... Boom, the show of nascency. Who was the first gem? Was it? Oh, look at his outfit. Look at his. Is that a bag? Your kind appeared, a new form of mineral life. Red Diamond was the first to be born. And then reaching out to Sensei. It is sort of like a baby, like, you know, reaching out for the parent for the first time. <sighs> Fwomp. They can't walk yet. The physical makeup and structure of this new creature were similar to my own, and I recognized it as a life form, closer to myself than any I'd encountered before. At the same time, 
Its outward appearance and mannerisms shared many similar similarities with those of the ancient creatures, young. I determined that I should take this creature in and provide it with a healthy, civilised lifestyle. So he crafted the eyes. Like, they probably, they, so they don't need eyes and things like that. I guess ears to hear and speak, I guess. But it's just to, you know, make them in keeping with a more human-like appearance. And they're learning to put clothes on for the first time. They don't want to eat. Taking a lesson. <laughs> this is so wholesome. Something that we really get <laughs> in Asuki no Kuni, you know, the happy moments. Why are we different colors? Your red color is caused when nitrogen gets into the crystal structure during the growth process and creates a deficiency in carbon atoms, creating an extremely rare red. I want to be the same as you. That's why they do the powder. <laughs> Look at that face. You know, I thought, so we'd always thought that the powder was um, an aesthetic reason, and it is, like, so it doesn't, they don't appear, appear, you know, the color that they're underneath, and I guess everyone looks the same, but the other reason is because the first gem wanted to be like Sensei, with the, I guess, the powdered skin. Uh -huh. There's, yeah, more of them dropping down. A halide mineral made of fluorine and calcium, which it is called fluorite. Its chemical makeup is rather different from ours, but let's help. This one is soft. We'll need a facility to provide shelter from sand and dust. We'll carve out that large quartz stone and make ourselves a place to live. And that brings us to today. You all have given me so much happiness. I wanted to give you a new pure land. To this day, I have searched for a way to solve all of this. But limited as I am, all I've done is prolong a war of which you are the victims. Maintaining a status quo that is far from my ideal. I am truly sorry. As of now, I want you to leave me it and go, you beautiful, lustrous life forms. Oh my god, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I feel so bad for all the times I ragged on Sensei for being like a unnecessarily mysterious, but this is so sad. He made the best of, you know, a really tough situation in a tough post-apocalyptic world. And he did create a really happy family life for all of them, even though, you know, they all had issues and stuff, but that's just normal. Oh, man. Now he's telling them all to go. You may follow the gem who was once phosphophyllite, one of your own. That is one path you may choose. Notice he said he was once phosphophyllite, so he knows that the old, the original phos that he personally took in from the Shore of Nascency is no longer, that's no longer them. End of chapter 64. <laughs> it's amazing that a manga can, you know, stir up all these emotions. Even, like it's without you know moving pictures and music and no angle well they are angle shots with how it's written but you know what I mean like I guess because we get so much more backstory and details and 
insights into the different relationships between all of the gems with Sensei and then with each other. It just, there's so much more emotional fodder there. It's amazing. Chapter 65 today. What are they going to do? The things I have done to you can never be forgiven. I recommend that you follow your your fellow gems and remove me from your lives. This is just mind bending. Cinnabar's like, well, Cinnabar already made their choice. They don't want Sensei to be alone. Phosphophyllite is not one of us. Oh, bullet. Oh, so Cinema was about to talk. I first before bullet cut in. That traitor found easy targets to test and deceive. It was devious and arrogant. I could never follow such a coward. <sighs> They're not wrong. There is a strong possibility that the alliance with the moon is only temporary. I suspect Phosphophyllite's ultimate goal is to rescue all of you from this twisted and primitive world that I have created. Phosphophyllite is right. Go to the moon, please. Oh, Sensei, I guess that explains why Sensei was fine with everything that Foss was doing because they knew. They knew already and had pinpointed exactly what Foss was trying to do that the gems, you know, really were the, the impetus for betraying Sensei. <sighs> Bort, yeah, Bort is very, <laughs> a really good general, you know. All these pieces of cloth lying everywhere. Eh? <gasps> Wait, someone's about to touch Sensei. It's nice to meet you, Congo. Oh, Yuk. You've lived a very long life. It must have been so hard. My name is Euclid, and I suggest a do-over starting today. Oh. Oh. Calling him Congo, not Sensei, like. The things I have done to you can never be forgiven. There is no way to redo them. If we cut all ties to the past just because it's a twisted one, then we will be young and immature forever. If we start now and work together as different beings to make up for each other's shortcomings, we should get different results this time. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Yeah, okay, so... The significance of Yuk calling Sensei Kongo by his name is like a mark of equality, right? As opposed to treating him like this senior authority figure that is always right and can make all the, sh all the calls. Uh, tolerance and equality. Those were held up as ideals in ancient times, but they never lasted long. Oh, <laughs> talking about us here. I know what you're trying to say. You think that my idea is a little naive. I cannot make that decision. Oh dear, well, I still think it's a better idea than faucets. <laughs> Do you mind waiting a moment? I haven't used this function in a long while. Function? What is he going to do? It doesn't work very well. 
Assuming that the correctness of phosphophyllite's actions is outside our predictive capabilities, and considering that your proposal is an unprecedented one befitting future life forms, then for the time being, I'll allow it. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. So that kind of fits in with... So he's trying to bend the rules of logical construction that have that he's been programmed with in order to allow or not allow certain things and with these rules you can always if you're smart enough and can find the loopholes you can bend them so that you can actually do what is new like what hasn't been done before that's so interesting Wait, so he hasn't used that function for a long time? Huh. I don't know. I mean, i got to think about this a bit more. But yeah, I'd love to know what you guys think as to what is happening here and what kind of function precisely he's talking about. Then once again, nice to meet you, Congo. <gasps> Yuke! But he's still a strong diamond. Pat. Oh. I beg your pardon. The official name that was given to me is Kongo Dai Jisho Jizo Bosatsu. I can touch all of you directly without triggering the hypersensitive reaction that shatters you. This is the one thing I intentionally hid from you. I am sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, that was the function that he was talking about. Okay. By nature, I am more suited to taking a subordinate role. I look forward to working under you. <laughs> D don't be our subordinate, be our equal. I've seen your darkness. <laughs> I will try. The hardest thing for me was to act like a leader in front of you all. Yeah, okay, so... Yeah, so the whole, he was programmed to be a subordinate underneath humans, and yet for all this time, he's been able to maintain this sensei role with all of them. Hmm, interesting. I had to make sure I was always scowling. <laughs> oh, man. To think that they spent all this time being kind of scared, but also really love Sensei. And now they're finding out that it was all a charade. What are we going to do about Padparacha? We'll come up with something. I'm going to the moon. Oh man, Rotio. Huh? I don't think I like the moon. No moon. I want to start over with Sensei. Stay out of this pipsqueaks, you're young and have nothing to lose. Stupid little twerps. Hey, enough of your PDA. <laughs> oh dear, dear. What about you? I'm staying here. You're not even going to think about it? Blues would say Yuka's right. Yeah, I think Topaz would too. I'm taking one of you with me. You pick who goes to the moon. Ah! <laughs> Is that Rutil still going on a rampage? Hey, <gasps> who's talking to Sinala? You started to say something before I spoke. No, I didn't. Yuke's going to come up with a plan. Come with me. No, I...
this is so great that um Cinnabar, I mean, it's Bot who's dragging Cinnabar along in on their plans and including them in the society. The shock on Cinnabar's face at being included. This is what Rutil used to look like. Yeah, brings back memories. <laughs> so they're controlling their Mercury really well. I mean, Rutil is scarier than the Lunarians. <laughs> Oh, look at them. Everyone just kind of surrounding, well, talking in a group and Cinnabar's right in the midst of all of that. Oh, man. <laughs> Again, I just, I can't shake the feeling that the way Foss engineered the deception, first of all, and then the uh, way that they left everyone in the loop I mean in the lurch not in the loop out of the loop actually that was just not the best way that they could have done it and I think they've done a lot of damage to the relationships and also to their own plans as well to the shocks and so obviously they're adapting to this new order of things and sensei has even become more open with his gem kids well equals now and the lunarians aren't going to be happy because <laughs> they're still there on the moon chapter 66 freedom even we lunarians are incapable of hating congo huh interesting to know you might call it an armor of love mm -hmm. <laughs> what have you heard about that yet the prince wanted to know huh no I haven't that was my prince impersonation <laughs> it was spot on now let me show you all to your quarters Wait, what about the armor? Later. What? No. Now, now, everyone is waiting for you. This way. The armor of love. So that is what enables Sensei to refuse the Lunarians. What? So I guess that's what is preventing him from going absolutely berserk, according to their theory of having to reset Sensei. It's that he loves the gems so much that no matter what they do, he'll just accept them as they are and not go psycho and it won't break him because he loves them so much and he understands them. The same way that he totally saw through Foss what Foss was trying to do and just let them go ahead with it. Ah, this armor of love. Why is everyone waiting for them? Who's everyone? The other gems? Look at that. <laughs> mansion. Holiday mansion. What is this? Like the Four Seasons or something? Is that a reception down there? Look at that. Uh, the deck up the top with the <laughs> umbrella and the deck chairs. You see those like lotus uh, flowers as well. Wow, it's a life of luxury. Wow, this room is huge. We renovated your lodging facility, Great Foss, and added a room for each of your friends. Oh, I, I see. <laughs> to solve your old problem with swarms of admirables <laughs> before, after. We mixed the, constric the construction materials with the scent they don't like to make sure they wouldn't bother you. It stinks. Whoa, pee. I wonder what that material was. Oh, I see. These two individuals will be a concierges. <laughs> if you have any complaints like the pillows being too hard or the temperature being too low, please allow them to help. 
I need you to fix my friends that you ground into sand. <laughs> oh man, Foss. I think Foss is getting a little bit desperate now because they promised, you know, especially promised Yellow and the others as well that they would be able to see their former partners with conveniently leaving out the fact that but first we have to reconvert them back from sand, which we don't really know is possible yet. <laughs> so we've got two concierges, room service and all that, I'm sure. Paparacha? Yellow, oh man. Pat, wait. Splush. Oh, was that? Yellow, yeah. <laughs> you see how efficient they are? Oh, so they're the ones that, of course, they know how to put back gems. You know, they've been constructing fake ones forever. These are the two. These are the two who repaired your friends earlier too. They have all kinds of qualifications. <laughs> I wonder if they have like counselling qualifications too. Uh huh. Oh, Pad Pad, Yellow reunited. Those two are going to have some really interesting conversations. You're awake. Yeah. Is that Paparaccia? Lex, Benito, it's been so long. I'm sorry about Christabel. It wasn't your fault. Paparaccia. Ame. Oh, that's a cute nickname, Ame. 84? Right. Impressive as always. And Pad Pad can tell them apart, which I'm super, super impressed with. And I don't think you've met either of these two. This is Kangorm, who used to live inside Ghost. And this is Goshen, one of the newest additions to the family. To the family, which has now been rent asunder, split in half by Foss's crazy plan. Man, I've never seen you moving before. Elder Papa. Oh, sorry, Elder Padapa. Regards. <laughs> so formal. Yeah, you're looking well, Daya. Oh, man, look at this. Padapa just being a chad. Just being like, hey, what's up? <laughs> I talked to Akimi about restoring the gems that got turned into sand. I was told it's going to take some time, but efforts will be made. Also, are you going to tell them that uh, Akimi had demanded something from you and sounded kind of angry that they hadn't disappeared yet? As you can see, the Lenarians were able to fix Padparadsha, so I think we can be optimistic. Oh, just putting the, the spin, right, on the words that they heard when really there wasn't much to warrant that much optimism. Isn't that great, Ella Yellow? Did you hear that? Yes. Legendary Padparacha. I was just playing hooky from the whole life gig. <laughs> That's so, the way that they talk is so in keeping with how cool they are, how cool they look. Whoa, you do say cool th Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even read that. You do say cool things. Oh, let me borrow that one. I want to say it about the time I slept for a hundred years. <laughs> Foss. We have company. Yeah, Kangom, I like that Kangom is remaining, you know, wary of especially Aikmia. Foss sweating? Is a is are they scared that Aikmia is going to like reveal that, sorry, we can't help you, you know, sand is sand and never going back to gem is this about the armor oh yes Foss says you're gonna put everyone back Akemia Akemia thank you Akemia shh <laughs> do not provoke the Lunarian the crazy Lunarian the psycho hates to be called by name twitch I just witnessed a fit of rage that melted a wall sorry Akemia Congo emits a substance that evokes positive feelings in humans. Makes sense. It was made to, you know, 
out of um, from a sentimental standpoint. Though created by humans, all of Congo's abilities surpass their own. They feared that this would make the machine an object of hatred and jealousy and that it would be scrapped as a result. So they added this armor as an auxiliary function. Oh. Okay, so, I mean, in our day and age, right, people are scared of machines taking over the world and AI and all of that. And uh, so to ensure that that wouldn't happen, they added love. <laughs> As we are all one third human, it does affect us, albeit weakly. You all lived in close proximity to the machine for a long period of time, so its influence over you is great. Oh, you will harbor an unconditional love for Congo despite the obvious differences between you, which causes you fragile, breakable gems to instinctively act in pairs. You spread yourselves out over your admittedly small land to watch out for our attack. I could hardly call it an efficient method for protecting your race. In fact, this formation is more suited to protecting a specific entity at your center, Congo. Oh uh, no, Akia, do you just like twisting the knife of truth even more to paint Sensei in this bad, ominous light? Wait, okay, let's. Okay, so. He's basically saying that the only reason why the gems feel affection for Sensei is because of this ingredient, this armor of love that he was, that was mixed in by the humans. It's not actually rooted in any real relationship. And again, he's using, he's basically repeating what Foss said, just in much more fancier language that um, sensei isn't the same as them and is really just using them to protect himself. <sighs> the reason Congo lets this persist is that no attempt to change it will ever succeed. Due to the machine's own nature, you instinctively take up that formation as if it were your own atomic structure. And so the only option was to let things stand as they were. Now I have a question for you. Congo has given you the one thing that was most valuable to humans. Do you know what that is? Beauty. Look. <laughs> of course, coming from the vein of Foss. Well, yes, that is valuable. Compassion, not dire. Pep. <laughs> Mis mischievousness. Adorableness. Yeah, that. Kindness. <laughs> I love how they all respond based on personality. The correct answer is freedom. The machine never locked up any of its precious, precious gems. Congo doesn't have much to offer you, but that gift was the most sensible. Perhaps it was a response to the severe restrictions that Congo is subject to. Or perhaps the tool wishes you to be something resembling the human masters it once served. It's... And is he slicing another eyeball? Like another pearl eye, maybe. You know, he's just cloaking everything that Sensei ever did for them in a selfish light. Like, so what? Like, you know, things like being able to let them choose their own paths and loving them, um, creating a family like atmosphere. All of that is good stuff. Like, that's good. He's all linking it back to how Congo is just using them to recreate his fantasy of living with humans again. 
I do not like egg meal. And it's odd because obviously at the same time that they're having this conversation, Kongo Sensei back said to the gems who are back on Earth, you know, that they can choose to go to the moon or not. Like that's the ultimate gift that he can always give them. It's freedom. But she can is great. Like that doesn't make Sensei, you know, this evil mastermind that is playing these mind games with the gems. Now that you have left the Earth's surface, Congo's influence will gradually wear off. I want you to take back your senses and your pride as mineral life forms and join with me. True freedom is something you should claim for yourself. That is all. Now you should get plenty of rest. So just <laughs> make me a giving cicada that meatball, whatever it is. True freedom is something you should claim for yourself. I don't know, this, okay, I will talk a bit more about this later when I've had more time to sort of, for that line to percolate in my mind, because it just sounds... On the surface, it sounds reasonable, but if you dig beneath it more, it's really just another way to manipulate them. I want to take Piperacha in yellow and launch a night attack. Almost all of the gems will be at school during the night. If we show them how quickly you got Piperacha moving again, we can deal a heavy psychological blow to every gem at once. Yellow and some Lunarians will create a diversion. And I'll use that time to talk to Sensei. Or if that doesn't work, I'll apply as much physical stress as I possibly can. What do you think you're going to do, Foss? Like, smack them into <laughs> praying for the Lunarians? It just, again, it just reads like Foss being overconfident in what they can actually accomplish. And in their mind, they've got this beautiful plan. But when they actually go to execute it, it just falls apart. And there's all of these um, unforeseen factors that they haven't predicted. I cannot spare any personnel at night. The labor unions would complain. <laughs> okay, I love that they have labor unions. What? We did used to work at night in the past. I'm ashamed to admit it, but our society isn't like yours. With a population as large as this, individuals can't all keep their aspirations so high. We always wear a pile of trash after all. It gets especially difficult after so many years without results. The masses need goals that are likely to be accomplished in the short term with a stopping point easily in sight. <laughs> wow. Wait, so is Amia saying that... That they... Is he just confirming that they are the souls of human trash? <laughs> Which explains why no one prayed for them, because obviously the implication of being human trash is that no one cares about you. You either did something that made everyone hate you, or, you know, made made you not deserving of love, whatever. Or they were just, you know, born into unfortunate circumstances where they just didn't have anyone else to care for them. Ah, oh, interesting. And then, of course, I can hear the prince talking about how you need to control the masses by giving them accomplishable goals. Damn. Oh, it's such a stark contrast to what we just saw on Earth, where, you know, Sensei has lowered himself and then the gems have come stepped up to become equals to him and then... This is Akimi just saying, well, society is what it is. Like, you're going to have people that will have to do all the low, lowly jobs. <laughs> yeah, so you let them have their work unions, but... Your, your night attack will have to be just the three of you. Will that be all right? Prince, please let me go with the noble force. Cicada... <laughs> You're the only Lunarian with a conscience. Your prince is trash. Okay, well, Fuss can be 
pretty front in front of AQ. Only to operate the machinery. Don't evaporate on me. As for your request, that we restore the gems that we ground into sand. There are complications. A couple of things I'd like you to understand. <gasps> what things? Uh. <laughs> That's at the end of chapter 66. Sorry guys, we're going to have to do that next time. <laughs> uh, there's a, it's a few things that are sticking out in my mind that I kind of want to chat a little bit more about. So, Okay, so there's three main things I want to speculate on for a bit. And then I really welcome uh, you all to comment on these few chapters that we just read because they were pretty wild and very emotional, which... Um, kind of caught me by surprise so the first thing is what's happening on earth with Yuke stepping up and proposing this fresh start um, it's a recalibration of the gems relationship with Congo sensei um, who's no longer a sensei anymore because they've agreed to try and form a society that's based more on the values of equality and tolerance and I presume this means that they are going to come together to sort of rewrite how they run their little society and how they'll deal with the Lunarians and Foss and all the other gems that went with them to the moon. Um, I, you know, feel pretty good about this plan so far. Something will probably go wrong knowing, you know, Hoseki no Kuni. It is ironic though that, um, you know, I just... I wonder if that recalibration would have happened at all if it wasn't for Foss shaking up their society so much and if Sensei hadn't seen all of the remaining gems just breaking or cracking physically from this immense emotional stress that they were under at the thought of, you know, having eight of their own choose to leave and seemingly side with the Lunarians. Um, I also do love the fact that Sensei gave them a choice to follow Foss to the moon. You know, he wasn't salty about it, and he was as open as he could have been, telling them that it was his fault that they have to keep fighting and keep getting kidnapped um, in this perpetual war. But they all chose to stay with Sensei, I think for the same reason that Cinnabar did, um, they didn't want to leave Sensei all alone. Uh, and, you know, the way he was when the humans all left for so many years and Sensei's retelling of how the Lustrous came into his life, you know, as little babies and how he just carefully picked them up and sculpted them and gave them, you know, facial features and eyes and basically taught them how to do life. That story was amazing and it was really touching and so wholesome the way he just wanted to give them a good meaningful life and I think that was a big part of the reason why a lot of them well the ones but that were left behind chose to stay um so that wholesomeness <laughs> in such stark contrast to the second point that I want to bring up which is Aikmia's version of what Sensei did for the gems or rather like what he did with the gems. So Akimi is telling the gems on the moon that because of Sensei's armor of love that he was programmed with, um, the original purpose of which was to make Sensei weak as well, uh, weak like the humans so that he wouldn't surpass them too much. Because of that armor of love, Akimi says that the love that they feel for Sensei is actually manufactured. That it's all part of Congo's plan to have them be his shields against the attacks. Um, maybe even recreate um, the sense of being with humans, but nothing more. You know, the gems are just there being used by him. That even the freedom that Sensei gives them is illusory because it's another way for him to manipulate their emotions for him 
So Akinio really emphasizes again how Sensei is not one of them, and hence of course the unconditional love that the gems feel for Sensei must not be real because, you know, how could you possibly love something that is completely not the same as you? Which sounds ridiculous, but the way that Akinio puts it is very matter of fact and shrouded in seemingly technical language that then gives it this semblance of legitimacy and it seems like the gems maybe except for Kangom are just eating it all up for now at least um thirdly and last of all is how Foss continues to hide things from the other gems especially the conversation that they had with Akemir about being able to restore gems from the sand when whether that's feasible or not and Akima says that it's going to be a lot harder doing that as compared to restoring Patpa and to expect it to take a very 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 long time and then when Foss has to report back to the other gems on this they use Padpa as like an advertisement basically for how amazing lunar technology is and how that that gives them a lot of good reason to be optimistic about being able to restore gems from sand which was such a marketing move and you know I don't know I just throughout this volume I really felt that Foss was still maintaining that underhanded way of keeping all of the gems on the moon in line and the fact that they were surprised that as soon as they realized that the sand they were standing on was actually gem particles you know what was left of their beloved gems and they all started breaking and Foss was shocked at that I was like man they really did not think this through all in all I'm very sad that we now have this um split between the gems on earth who are trying to build a more equal and tolerant society with the truth out now about sensei or at least as much as truth as was possible to get out and then on the other hand the gems on the moon who are being subject still to the wiles and the manipulations of Akemia and to a certain extent boss um I still sense a full-on civil war coming especially now with Foss's latest plan to attack at night with Yellow and Pudpa. Despite that, I am very much looking forward to the impending confrontation between Pudpa and Rutil. I don't think it's going to be a happy one at all, especially, you know, with Rutil being so obsessed about being the one to restore Pudpa personally and then now just having that taken away against their will. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I look forward to any thoughts that you guys might have. And uh, that is it for this reading. Uh, I also hope you guys are enjoying this journey as much as I am. And I can't wait to find out what happens next. And I was kind of bummed that I had to stop it here. So until next time, guys, as always, take care and be good. <laughs>